Advent. We are rejoicing that you are here with us today as we contemplate waiting for the coming of the Lord. We are waiting for his second appearing. In fact, the scripture tells us we are to long for that appearing. And so as we revisit the Advent season and the Christmas tide, we will be waiting and anticipating the coming of Jesus Christ. Our announcements this morning basically consist of the fact that we have been able to put together our live nativity again for this December, despite the coronavirus and all the pandemic restrictions we are under. We had a nice crew that was here yesterday building the stable. Our animals are prepared and ready to come, and we have put plans in place to safely fill the stable with the characters uh, from the nativity. So we encourage you to come and visit us on December 11 and 12 to invite your families and friends to drive through and revisit the meaning of Christmas. So we are thankful to those who have taken their time and uh, bringing the animals, getting us ready for that wonderful community event. Traditionally, on the first Sunday of Advent, there are a couple of songs that we tend to join in together, and we will do that again today. I think it is important, as everything is strange and unusual this year, that we find some tradition that we can rest in. And so we are going to sing together, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. If you have a hymnal at home with you, it is number 211. We'll be doing verses 1, 2, and 6.
Book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry. And I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with young. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We live in a culture uh, that is not very good at waiting. Uh, That's because most of the time we don't have to. We don't have to wait for mom to prepare a a huge meal, to go through all the work and slave away in the kitchen. All you have to do is pop something into the microwave oven and in minutes, it's ready. Or we can just head to our favorite fast food uh, restaurant. There we can get our food in, in less than a minute. And if it takes longer than a minute, we can give that restaurant a bad review for their slow service. And then we have express checkout lanes at the supermarket or at Walmart. And you you go and and you can um, avoid those long lines that are backed up by people who have a million and one things to check out. And they have all of these coupons to go through, and and their credit card doesn't seem to be going through. And if we go to that express lane, and, and the person in front of us has one thing over the limit, we can glare at them. And we no longer have to go to the library to find information that we need. We don't have to pour over all of those books and all of uh, the study materials. All we have to do is Google it. Just, Just hit a button on a search word and millions of things pop up. Now, we don't have to wait for anything. And if we do have to wait for anything, we get very impatient. In this age of instant everything, we are not good at waiting for anything. Maybe that's why we struggle to understand and appreciate the season of Advent. Advent seems to get lost in the shuffle of the Christmas season. We want to jump right to Christmas, but we miss Advent. Advent literally means coming or arrival. Advent is a a season of waiting for something that is going to happen. Two somethings, actually. 
On the one hand, the Advent is a period of waiting for the Son of God to come the first time as a baby. A little baby born in Bethlehem. Of course, that that coming has already taken place. What we're really doing is waiting for the celebration of that. Christmas Day. That day that that children have a hard time waiting for. But I I think the reason they have a hard time waiting for Christmas Day is is more about the presence, really, than about the Christ child that we are celebrating. On the other hand, Advent is a period of preparing and waiting for Christ's second coming. This time, he will be coming as a conquering king. This is the part of Advent that that gets swallowed up by Christmas. Because we don't often think about him coming back again. We we love to celebrate that little baby. It, It gives us warm, fuzzy feelings. But we have a hard time wrapping ourselves around that second coming. And when you think about it, if you think about it at all, that second coming is, is hard to wait for, too. Because that, that second coming is about um, God really fixing his kingdom and, and fulfilling his kingdom. So that everything will be brought right. And the problem is that, that Jesus said 2,000 years ago that he's coming back. And we're still waiting. This sermon is the first in a four-week series that examines what we're really waiting for. We live in a world that seems to be spinning rapidly out of control. This current COVID pandemic appears uh, to be accelerating rather than receding. Our lives have been disrupted in in so many ways by this. And we keep waiting for it to end. We keep waiting for the scientists to come up with a vaccine. Political and social tensions are are worse than ever, partly because of COVID, uh, partly because it's, it's been election year, and partly because people are just getting angry. And we seem to be living in an age where, where people are making up their own rules for living. And so morality seems to spiral out of control. We, need, we, we desperately wait for someone to come and put our lives in order to rescue us from ourselves. Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 11, tells us that someone is coming. And that someone is described as the shepherd who will come to set things right and perfectly shepherd his people. In verse 1, God tells Isaiah to speak to his people. He says, comfort, comfort my people. God's people need comfort. They need to comfort back then. If you read the the whole prophecy of Isaiah, the first 39 chapters speak of God's judgment on his people. It speaks of of a coming day when when the Babylonians will sweep in and they will destroy Jerusalem and they will take off the people into exile. God's judgment is harsh and cruel. When people are in exile, they they long for their homeland. They're desperate for God. They are despondent. They believe that God has rejected them and forgotten them. And God wanted the people to know that even in the deepest, darkest days of their exile, 
he had not ultimately rejected them. He was with them. He was not going to forget them. They were still his people. Their punishment was was not meant to destroy them, but, but to purify them, to bring them back to their senses, to bring them back to the Lord. The harshness of punishment is offset by the tenderness of God for his people. He brings comfort. The hardship and the misery that that they will go through in exile that feels like warfare will not be forever. Even though it will feel like it's going on forever. We felt like this COVID thing has gone on forever, haven't we? And it feels like it will continue to go forever. But even though it feels like it will be forever, forever, Israel's debt of sin has been paid fully by the shepherd that she is waiting for. As harsh as the punishment is that the Lord will inflict on Israel, it will be nothing compared to his blessings that he will dole out when they receive the Lord. It is so certain that that God speaks in the present tense rather than the future tense. He says it has happened. Now, those words are applicable to us, God's people living today. If this COVID pandemic isn't judgment against us, it is certainly a a wake-up call. We have, uh, in this country at least, allowed the glitz and the glamour of the American dream to draw our focus away from God. We're distracted. We don't, we don't have the time to, to sit and to ponder and to focus and to meditate upon God and all he means to us. We're more devoted to political causes, political solutions to our problems. Thinking that we know more than God does about our lives, uh, we set off on our own way. We reject God's way. We reject God's word, and we, and we blaze our own trail. We do what we want to do. We have wandered away from God. We're like sheep, like sheep without a shepherd. Throughout the scriptures, we're, we're often compared to sheep, Um, And that's not a flattering thing. Because as I understand it, uh, sheep are are not the smartest animals in the country, in the world. They they need somebody to lead them. They easily wander away. They easily, easily get distracted. That's why we need a shepherd. That's why God speaks tenderly to us just as he did to Israel. Our punishment will not last forever. God has set a limit. The first time he sent the shepherd to us, the shepherd paid the penalty for our sin. His blood covers our sin. And when he comes again, he will bring blessings with him. He will come as a conquering hero. But are we ready for that? Oh, we say we are. We, we want God to come and, and straighten things out and, and, and show the world that we've been right all along. But really, are, are, are we ready? Israel wasn't ready for the type of shepherd that came the first time and we're not exactly ready for his second coming either. Author uh, Doug Mendenhall shares a brief parable that shows how most of us might react 
when, when we know that Christ is coming in just a few minutes. He writes, Jesus called the other day to say he was passing through and wondered if he could spend a day or two with us. I said, sure, love to see you. When will you hit town? I mean, it's Jesus, you know. And it's not every day you get the chance to visit with him. It's not like it's your in-laws and you have to stop and decide whether the advantages outweigh your having to move to the sleeper sofa. That's when Jesus told me he was actually at a convenience store out by the interstate. I must have gotten that Bambi and headlights look because my wife hissed, what is it? What's wrong? Who is that? So I covered the receiver and I told her Jesus was going to arrive in eight minutes. And she ran out of the room and started giving guidance to the kids in that effective way that marine drill instructors give guidance to recruits. My mind, was, my mind was already racing with what needed to be done in the next eight, no, seven minutes so Jesus wouldn't think we were reprobate loser slobs. I turned off the TV in the den, which was blaring some weird, scary movie I'd been half watching. But I could still hear screams from our bedroom. So I turned off the reality show it was tuned to. Plus, I, I turned off the kids' set out on the sun porch because I didn't want to have to explain John and Kate plus eight to Jesus six minutes from now. My wife had already thinned out the magazines that had been accumulating on the coffee table. She put Christianity Today on, on top for a good first impression. Five minutes to go. I looked out the front window, but the yard actually looked great thanks to my long, hard work. So I let it go. What could I improve in four minutes anyway? I did notice the mail had come, so I ran out to grab it. Mostly it was Netflix, envelopes, and a, a bunch of catalogs tied into recent purchases. So I stuffed it back in the box. Jesus doesn't need to get the wrong idea. Three minutes from now, about how much online shopping we do. I ran back in and picked up a bunch of shoes left by the door tried to stuff them in the front closet, but it was overflowing with heavy coats and work coats and snow coats and pretty coats and raincoats and extra coats. We live in the South. Why do we buy so many coats? I squeezed the shoes in with two minutes to go. I plumped up sofa pillows. My wife tossed dishes into the sink. I scolded the kids and she shooed the dog. With one minute left, I realized something important. Getting ready for a visit from Jesus is not an eight-minute job. Then the doorbell rang. Now, getting, getting ready for Jesus is more than an eight-minute job. And in fact, it's, it's more than a four-week job or a year-long job. It's a lifetime job. It takes more than a touch-up here and an adjustment there. We can't keep on cozying up to sin and expect that God will bless us beyond our wildest imaginations. We're waiting for the shepherd to come back, but we have to prepare the way. We have to be ready. In this wilderness of sin we find ourselves in, we need to clear away the obstacles that hinder Christ's coming into our lives. We need to fill up the valleys and level the mountains. We need to straighten out the crooked paths. Now, I have to say that that makes it sound like we do all the work. But really, we can't. We, we can't do all of that stuff. We can't prepare ourselves unless God empowers us. And indeed, he has empowered us through his spirit to do what we need to do to prepare for Christ's coming. 
We clear a path for Jesus to come when we repent of our sin and invite him into our lives to, to clean up the life that we have led and prepare for his coming. We cry out for awakening and revival and for his return to make things right, but we haven't fallen on our faces in repentance to clear the way for it. Jesus is coming. He is coming in glory. Are we ready? The reason we can be certain that our punishment won't last forever and that Jesus is coming is that the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. It's a promise. It's a done deal. God always keeps his promises. God demonstrates the certainty of his word by contrasting it with uncertain human existence. We put our faith in humans to to fix the mess we're in, but we are so fragile. In verse 5, the Lord instructs the prophet to cry out and remind the people that they are like grass or the flower of the field. Now, now grass and flowers are very fragile. When he compares our life with grass and flowers, that doesn't give us too much hope for durability. Even in the summertime, any weakling can come along and pull the grass and uproot a flower. You could mow the grass and even mow over your wife's flower beds. A little drought and the, and the grass will wither. The flowers will fade. You drop a lighted match, especially in, during the drought, and Poof, everything goes up in smoke. That's what, that's what the prophet Isaiah compares us to, grass, flowers. Life is fragile. We can be snuffed out in a moment. Just like that. Even if, even if we live to be a hundred years old, when you look at that against eternity, that is just a nanosecond. Our words and our deeds are quickly forgotten. We have no substance apart from the Lord. By contrast, the word of our God stands forever. When God says it, it is as good as done. God never takes back anything that he says or apologizes for misspeaking because he he doesn't say anything that, that needs an apology. He doesn't have to backtrack. He never has to go back on his word because he didn't he, he doesn't have the power to do what he, he promised. He has that power. He can do what he promises, and he will. God's word has eternal significance, and it is applicable at all times and in all places. That's that's why when you read his word in the Old and New Testaments, those words apply to your life today. They're eternal. And so when God says that punishment is coming, we can be certain it's coming. And when he says that there's a limit to the punishment, that it will end one day, we can be certain that it will end. And when he says that the shepherd is coming, we better be ready, because he is coming. But what can we expect when the shepherd comes? We can expect a shepherd with both strength and tenderness. In verse 9, the Lord instructs the prophet to to climb a high mountain and shout the news with all his strength, Behold your God! 
Your God is here. Look at him. And when the Lord comes, he will come with might. He will rule with strength and with, will rightfully receive his kingdom. He will take his rule. He will take his seat on the throne. The picture of the Lord coming with strength to rule over his kingdom might be a terrifying thing, especially if you're on the wrong side of the king. If you're one of the king's enemies, that doesn't sound very good. And it would be terrifying for all of us, all of us if it weren't for the picture we just see of him in verse 11. History is is littered with strong human leaders who come and they sweep into power and they destroy their enemies. They use power and intimidation. But look at the picture of the Lord coming as a shepherd. The Lord will tend his flock like a shepherd. How does, how does a shepherd care for his flock? He cares for his flock. He will lead and guide his flock. He will protect his flock. And yes, he will feed his flock. You see, the strength part, his strength ensures that his flock is protected from any enemy. No enemy can overcome him because of his strength. He doesn't use his strength to destroy the flock, he uses his strength to destroy the enemies of the flock. No enemy can snatch these sheep out of his hand, out of his grasp. And the shepherd, catch this imagery, the shepherd will gather the lambs in his arms and gently hug them close to his chest. He will gently lead the mother sheep. Brothers and sisters, the the one who identifies himself as the good shepherd is coming. He's coming. We We can bank on that because the Lord has said he is coming again. And he is coming not to inflict more punishment, but to gather his sheep into his arms and to guide them into eternal green pastures where they will be with him forever. And his sheep hear his voice and they follow him. They know him. Those who don't belong to him will will run away. They will scatter. But those who know him will be drawn to him and receive his protection. This is our sure and certain hope during Advent and at all times. Whatever you're going through today, whether it's financial difficulties, whether uh, you're struggling with COVID, whether you're struggling uh, with depression, whether you're struggling with illness, Whether you, you, whether you think of it as punishment or not, or just a test of your faithfulness, it is limited. God will not allow that to overcome you. Whatever you're going through is limited by God's love and mercy. Your daily trials, your afflictions, even persecution are meant to refine you and to make you stronger. So don't give up. Keep waiting. Your shepherd is coming. Turn away from your sin and raise your arms to that shepherd and receive him when he comes. Let's pray. Good shepherd, so hard to wait for you. 
We long to see you face to face. We long for the ending of all of our affliction, our trials, our tribulations. We long for an end of this COVID pandemic, of our financial difficulties, our our struggles. And it is so hard to wait. Not only not only for Christmas, but also. It is so hard to wait for that day when you say you will come as a good shepherd and take your flock into your arms. Lord, haste the day. But until that day does finally come, I pray that you will give us that perseverance to wait with eagerness and patience. Strengthen our resolve. Don't allow us to give up so close to the finish line. Thank you for giving us this image of you as shepherd. Thank you for the period of Advent where we can slow down and ponder your goodness, your graciousness, your mercy, your love your promises. Help us, O Lord. It is in Jesus' name that we pray this prayer. And in his name we pray the prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will close our worship this morning with the singing of another traditional opening of Advent hymn. This is a great Wesleyan hymn that we enjoy from our Methodist tradition, written in 1744. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, come, set us free. Free us from our sins and our fears, and let us find that rest in thee, that rest in the shepherd's arms. Come, thou long-expected Jesus. Spirit, Ru-
Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy, peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen. We will be singing a congregational benediction. Join along with us. This is to the refrain of, O come all ye faithful. And these words will be prayers for us as we um, go through this Advent series together. to us our shepherd oh come to us our shepherd 